Good morning and welcome to the sixth edition of the Goa Arts and Literature Festival 2015. Um, today, here we have with us Sir K. Anish Ahmed and Ma'am Sadaf Zas. Sir Ahmed is a writer and a publisher, and Ma'am over here is also a writer and an entrepreneur. So, first, I would like to ask you the question um, You've written three works of fiction In My Hand, Good Night, Mr. Kissinger, and 40 Steps. Can you tell us how did you get the ideas to write them? So, you know, ideas come from all kinds of different places. They come from what you see in life around you. They come from um, what you've read and how that provoked you or inspired you from your memories. So for the three works I've written, 40 Steps is actually the oldest of the works and I wrote it in my early 20s, a long time ago, 20 years ago. But that work is actually about an old man, 60 years old, who's about to die. And uh, that was inspired by the theme of regret and loss and what life would feel like when you look back. Uh, as I grew older, my later works, the short stories uh, are also about, you know, um, teenage love and uh, youth and so on and so forth. So you don't necessarily write directly about what you're experiencing mm -hmm. right now or have experienced just in the recent past. And that's the dimension of imagination in these. Right. You try to imagine other stages of life and other lives that are not yours, that are not like yours. Um, the novel, The World in My Hands, mm -hmm. which was published from India as well, that was, uh, of all these works, uh, the one most inspired by uh, recent circumstances. Mm -hmm. That was my response to a state of emergency that Bangladesh went through in 2007 right. and 8. So that's a very overtly political work and social commentary. Ma'am, you have studied molecular cell biology. What made you to get into the field of writing, especially poetry? Um, I always like stories, mm -hmm. um, so that's I think why I was I studied biology in the first place. The the greatest story of all how we work, exactly. um, and uh, you know exploring that. Um, but I I do write poetry, and I have for a very young age. Um, and the art of using words, a um, few words, to express very intense emotions that you feel, um, whether it whether it be something intensely personal that you're going through yourself or something that moves you or you feel very strongly mm -hmm. about. And just to deal with it myself, I would write those words down on paper and um, I, I think it was a way to sort of figure life out as well for me. For every writer, the first work is very close to their hearts. Your debut poetry, um, Sari Reams, that was published in 2013, can you tell us more about it? It's a collection of uh, poems that I'd written over the past, you know, 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, and I finally got the courage, I think, to share them with the world. Um, and I, I also didn't do it, cr didn't put them in a chronological order. Uh -huh. Um, so I don't know if people who read it will know when I wrote what. In fact, some of the poems uh, I wrote seem relevant today because I think when you're writing poetry, it can be appear very political as mm -hmm. well, even if it's something that it's intensely moved you your, yourself about. Sir, you're a publisher of Bengal Lights, Dhaka Tribune, also the founder of Dhaka Translation Centre and the director of Dhaka Literary Festival. How do you devote or manage your time for writing? Um, the trick, uh, as I like to say, is delegation. But uh, to be less cheeky and more honest, uh, I've been lucky in finding uh, friends who are you know, the best people for these particular uh, endeavors. And frankly, I wouldn't have done them if that friend wasn't there to collaborate with. So Bengal Lights, the editor is Kadimul Islam. Um, Surely the best editor in Dhaka, uh, Dhaka uh, Tribune is a newspaper. Zafar Saban is a good friend, the editor. He wanted to start a newspaper, so some friends and I got together to be the publishers of it. Mm -hmm. Dhaka Translation Center is led by Kaiser Haq, who is uh, Bangladesh's leading poet in English. So they're in very able hands. I provide a kind of platform and collaborate with them on a strategic level, but they figure out how to make it work. As for the Lit Fest, uh, Sadaf, uh, and myself, and another friend of ours, Asan Akbar, who lives in London, we work on that together and we bring different expertise to it. We focus on different aspects of putting it together. But to be honest, the, um, the, the real heavy burden rests on Sadaf, who's also the producer of the festival. And you know, you have to be sort of, if you want to write, 
Uh, my real answer on how you find time is uh, you have to want to do it badly enough. That's, that's the only way you'll find the time. The answers about whether you get up early, whether you write at, uh, late at night, those are incidental. The real issue is do you want to do it badly enough? And uh, in my experience, I also find that the two things that will most want you to do it badly enough, if you're somebody who already wants to do it, are two things. One is realizing uh, that I'm going to die is not an abstract thing. It is something that's going to happen someday soon. Once you realize that, you realize it's time to get moving and do something. And if even that doesn't work, then what will work is um, seeing a friend who you don't uh, think is uh, smarter than you get published. And then you start writing. <laughs> Ma'am, you have written monologues named That Which Cannot Be Said. Can you tell us more about them? This was a project I had with the uh, women's group that I've been involved, involved with for many years. Uh, we have a network of women's led uh, women's organizations all over Bangladesh. There's 64 districts in Bangladesh, and there's um, women's organizations from all of these dis districts. Um, and the idea was to basically try and connect the greater population with what a lot of women go through, which is often not understood right. um, and uh, often women are judged by the decisions they make because people don't understand the socio-political uh, context that they live in. Um, and so I gathered together uh, about over 60 women's testimonies from you know, all different kinds of women. Um, but put them together in a way that um, uh, could be conveyed easily to an audience. Mm -hmm. And we had women um, from out of Dhaka performing the monologues. Mm -hmm. And I really do think it connected. I mean, we were a bit nervous. We, we put on a production in Dhaka. Um, and we were a bit nervous how uh, the communities right. would take it. Because we were exploring some subjects that were um, seemingly sort of taboo mm -hmm. subjects regarding, with regards to women's sexuality um, and women's choices. But I think we were able to uh, really connect through you know, this powerful medium of theater right. um, and, and get across some of the issues that sometimes when you read like a non-fiction article mm -hmm. uh, are not easily conveyed. Sir, you're currently working on a novel about extreme foodies in New York. Can you tell us more about it? Oh, sure. Um, what inspired that idea is that I lived uh, in New York for seven years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm very interested in cities. My uh, last two books were set in Dhaka, which is an extreme form of a city. And New York, of course, is also an iconic city. So I wanted to write about New York. But what I didn't want to do was write from, uh, quote, immigrant experience. So I had to come up with a different kind of idea. And what I came up with is the idea of two friends. One, a highly deracinated Bengali, deracinated Muslim. And another is his um, um, friend who is a sort of fallen New England aristocrat. And they decide to start a wild game restaurant. And it gives me a chance to explore a lot of different things, including through the issue of wild game, you know, ideas of endangerment. Um, and, you know, we live in an age when food has become such a celebrated thing. And I'm personally a bit skeptical about this whole foodism business. I think uh, there is a lot of uh, sort of uh, con around it. <laughs> so I want to look into that. Um, but also food gets us into something very fundamental. Right. You know, what is appetite? What is desire? What is need? What is excess? So I want to explore all those themes uh, through this novel and see how it comes out. You both are associated with the Dhaka Literary Festival. Can you tell us how different it is from other festivals around the world? I think one thing um, about Dhaka Lit Fest is Bangladesh is a country uh, which is not really known by the rest of the world. We know ourselves we have a rich literary tradition and culture. Uh, the idea was to showcase um, our history and culture to the world, what is being written in a, in a contemporary uh, Bangla writing and English writing in Bangladesh and take it to the rest of the world um, and also bring the rest of the world to Bangladesh. Uh, okay. But what we do try and do is instead of keeping it very insular, um, it's very international, it has a diverse range of topics, we try and keep the quality of the sessions very high but at the same time celebrate all types right. of literature like you know our oral 
history as well. Mm -hmm. So we have sort of very raw performances that have been passed down through centuries from the villages, um, which is part of our rich oral poet poetry tradition and theatre tradition. Um, and at the same time have some of the world's greatest literary figures and thinkers also in conversation. Mm -hmm. And we have Bangla next to English. Um, we don't want to do it too huge, although it is, it is pretty big. We, this year we had over 60 writers from wow. abroad, from Cuba to Kenya, from USA to UK, from Nobel Prize winners to, um, you know, the village, uh, you know, theatre um, from, from a tiny village in Tanga, three hour, uh, hours out of Dhaka. Um, but the idea is to get our young people to sort of see the broad range of subjects and topics, to be able to discuss very difficult topics, um, but in a very respectful way. Right. Um, so uh, the idea is to keep it intimate, keep it real, keep it um, relevant, and not make it too big, yeah. but big enough so that one can celebrate the array of literature. So would you like to add something more on that? Uh, yeah, I'll add one thing. You know, our program is very carefully curated, as are all programs in all lit fests. But we also have some particular intellectual concerns that we very subtly uh, are exploring year after year through the kind of discussions we have, and namely the idea of internationality or internationalism. We we live in a so-called global era, and literature too is now seen as a global or globalized phenomenon. So, you know, people write from the subcontinent and a lot of writers get picked up in the West. But I feel the politics of what gets picked up, what gets left out, even what then gets importance in the home domain and uh, gets what kind mm -hmm. of circulation, these are not discussed enough. Either you get a very simplistic nativist uh, critique saying that, oh, anyone who gets big in the West must be a sellout, which is not true. Or you get a certain uh, cosmopolitan disdain or dismissal that these issues are not important enough. I've made it and I don't want to be bothered about why I've made it. Um, we want to look at, especially in the context of Bangladesh, uh, the issue of language and vernacular. Um, for example, why is it that so many Indians get picked up in the West but not so much from the vernaculars? It just cannot be that people writing in Hindi or Marathi or Bengali are just not as smart as anyone mm -hmm. who writes in English. There is a problem here and we don't talk about it openly enough or with clarity enough. So in Bangladesh, we are very conscious of that because we have a very different, strong history of language. Our independence was led or inspired by a language movement, and Bangla remains the dominant language. English is actually a very small mm -hmm. secondary language in Bangladesh. But does that mean just because we have Bangla, we cannot be international? No. no. We, we are international in our conception. The fact that the world fails to see it is their problem, and we want to figure out what that problem is. You both had sessions here at the Goa Arts and Literature Festival. How was the response from the other delegates? Uh, I think there was an intense interest in Bangladesh. Uh, we had a, a lot of great energy, great questions, um, and we felt very welcome here. Uh, and I think we had some amazing discussions and, and some of the other panels uh, because I think it's a small festival which is also celebrating your, uh, you know, your heritage um, as Goa. And I learned, and I have learned a lot. Uh, and I think that the festival has been very well curated. Um, and it's very exciting to sort of see what's going on here. And it's exposed me also to a whole range of writers and issues that I, know I don't normally get to think of. So uh, yesterday after my panel, I went to the main lawn and there was a little stall there selling uh, Wada Pav and other things. And I was about to, you know, I was trying to figure out what it was. I wasn't sure because that's a term we don't have. And there was this uh, older lady there with uh, presumably her daughter. And they said, oh, I, we just heard your panel, etc." And then they insisted on buying me the Wada Pav. And in these years, all the festivals I've gone to, that has never happened. <laughs> So I feel that in Goa, there's a kind of warmth and kindliness we've uh, encountered that's you know, very memorable, very touching. And also I think you know, just what I said right now about the importance of language and on the one hand, taking pride in your own culture, but without becoming nativist about it or rejectionist about it, uh, being inclusive towards others and, and diversity, but at the same time also not giving up on it and trying to fit into a certain 
uh, form of globalized mainstreaming uh, that, that goes on. And I think that's an issue that has a strong resonance here as well. And in the way the, this particular festival uh, conceived of itself and, and deals with issues, but also go on culture itself. Okay. I think there's a kind of awareness about these issues and uh, the issue of language, the importance of Konkani to the people of Goa, etc. So we have a kind of, uh, you know, parallel uh, experience there and can, uh, you know, uh, it, it speaks to us a lot. So we've had a great time here. Um, and we love uh, how engaged people are in, in, in this festival. And it has a nice, small, intimate size um, all around. Splendid. Thank you so much for spending your time here with us, sir, and for inspiring us. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you so much for watching this interview, and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, stay tuned for more updates.